The governor's health plan gets the anticipated easy majorities. Now, can it claim the supermajorities it needs to make works work? That other component of the Hutchinson plan, what happened and what happens next? And the Arkansas economy, how solid the recovery. Arkansas Week, next. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. This is Arkansas Week. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for Arkansas Week. The administration's campaign for Arkansas Works has worked so far. But this past week, those were the easy votes. That's where we will begin. Jacob Kaufman joins us from KUAR Public Radio in Central Arkansas. Lance Turner, reporter, columnist, editor for Arkansas Business. And thanks, to guys, for coming in, Jacob. They were the easy votes this past week, to repeat myself. Uh, 50 plus one, though, isn't 75%. But we'll start with the victories, the administration. Yeah, uh, in pretty comfortable margins in terms, of, in terms of those majorities so far. I believe this morning they passed, uh, the final versions passed in the House and Senate. It's going to the governor's desk. Uh, 70 votes the first time around in the House. Uh, they need 75 in the Senate. I think they had 25. They need 27. So we know where the margins are. We know who, what players they're going to be looking at trying to convince. But uh, you know, Jeremy Gillum, the House Speaker, has said all along, and they've all tried to manage expectations on this. No one has said from the administration side or backers of Arkansas Works that we're going to get the three-fourths, we think, this first time around. So they said they'll take it one step at a time. And uh, so far, at least, it looks like they're in a position where they may be able to get those votes come next week when the fiscal session begins, when there is that three-quarters requirement for the funding bill of this Arkansas Works plan. Yeah, we're being maybe a little cryptic or vague here. What what happened this past week is that w the program was reauthorized. Arkansas Works, the uh, Hutchins administration's variant on the private option, which was a variant on the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. The tough part's getting the money for it. Right, so that's just the enabling legislation. And to complicate it a little bit further, next in the fiscal session that begins next week, uh, the Arkansas Works program will be lumped in with the rest of the Medicaid budget, which includes AR Kids First and all these other less controversial programs. So if there's going to be any minority votes, it only takes 25% uh, of either chamber to try to block this appropriation, to try to get it to be changed. They're also in some way threatening those programs, which of course the governor, I imagine, will be pointing to next week. Yeah, Lance. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this, this was, uh, I think the governor was, was, was pleased this week. He put out a statement uh, after the first round of voting in the House and Senate on Thursday saying he thought the votes uh, exceeded his expectations and, and indicated a strong bipartisan support for the Arkansas Works program. Uh, but there are some holdouts, uh, I think particularly in the Senate is where a lot of the heavy lifting is going to have to take place next week uh, to convince some really hardcore no's uh, to, to, to fully fund the thing. And I think, you know, even from Thursday to Friday, apparently this morning, we lost a few votes in the Senate uh, for Arkansas Works. And so um, there will be, you know, a lot of horse trading probably taking place next week, a lot of arm twisting. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess the question is, if, if, if you are in that minority, what is your overall goal? Because if you're going to hold everything up, if you're going to effectively shut down state government, then what is your plan uh, to to replace uh, the program, or um, you know, what is what what is your step beyond that? And then, of course, do you really even realistically have the backing then of uh, three quarters of the legislature to rally around that? So uh, it'll be an interesting set of questions and calculations that, that are already taking place, I'm sure, today and looking. Some next of week. the holdouts, maybe all of them, say we're not holding out. We're firm. We're opposed. It's not a question of we're bargaining. So what what can the administration do? Uh, it remains to be seen what the administration can do. I spoke with Bob Ballinger, a state representative who's opposed to this and has been in the legislature since the private option, its predecessor, was created back in, and authorized in 2014. And he said, right, we expect to all stick together, all 30 of us in the House. We, we're not going to suddenly be for this. We're not looking for deals. No one has offered us any deals. And he said, I certainly have no deals to offer people to stick together with the no votes. 
But he'll say, you know, if, if the solution is we cut the program, we take the $100 million hit to our budget, he'll say, I'm a conservative, a 3% across the board cut to the whole state budget. I'm fine with that. That's not a terrible outcome for me. And, you know, he, he thinks that critical services to him, like foster care, that the money is there for that. Well, they, they, these members also say we're not being stubborn. We're acting out of conviction. This is a deep felt. Right. And, since if the, and we ran. We told our constituents when we ran. No, we're opposed. We got elected. Right. And we just, of course, we just had a big primary shakeout over this with some several state legislative races. In general, the governor's candidates, the governor's back, back at the state uh, level, ended up winning in those races. And there are pr pretty, pretty explicit messaging all around about it being about this. Are you supporting Obamacare or is this not Obamacare? And Bob Ballinger, all the, uh, the people who oppose this plan, they'll say that whether or not this saves the state money is kind of not the question. We're, it's saving the state money because we're using an influx of federal dollars from the Affordable Care Act. So fundamentally, we're expanding the federal debt. Uh, Mary Bentley, she gave opening remarks against this bill from a uh, state representative from Perryville. Uh, she said, how can we ask our state representatives like Bruce Westerman to rein in federal spending when we won't do it in Arkansas? So, I mean, that's a matter of principle. All right. Let's. Politics did come to the floor of the House uh, on Thursday, of course, with Donnie Copeland making his uh, argument against the bill. Uh, and, of course, he was sort of, um, um, I guess, told not to speak on the bill, don't speak on the politics around it. But the politics around it, I mean, are inescapable. Uh, and he was voicing many of those same concerns. They put us here. Uh, those of you who were elected uh, running against the private option and running against Obamacare, you're here to vote no on this, and you need to stand firm. And Donnie Copeland, he's in North Little Rock and Sherwood, a state representative. And he tried to run for state senate against Jane English, who last year was one of those switch votes that was really critical to the plan getting to the point it is today, at least. And the, the criticism of her during the campaign is that she traded her vote for the private option in exchange for getting to retool the Department of Workforce Services in some way. That was during the BB administration. The, right. And she'll say they're related, that if we give people job training, they'll get off the Medicaid rolls. But so those are the kind of deals that people have in mind, at least, about what some of the possibilities are. The leverage you have is one of those few holdouts. All right. We'll continue to monitor. Now, along the way, uh, the administration had been pushing for uh, managed care for the, the most expensive components of the Medicaid uh, program, try to hold costs down. And it pulled that program down under uh, the rest strong recommendation of both the House and Senate, the Speaker and the pro tem. This is not the time to do it, Governor. And we knew this a little bit going into, going into the special session, that it was not a... It was not a stunning surprise. Right. <laughs> the task force had been considering all these issues for about a year or so. They were pretty much deadlocked. They couldn't pass a particular managed care plan out. There's a competing plan called Diamond Care that uses managed care, but not managed care companies to administer that managed care. Uh, so the governor pulled out from it. And in his opening remarks to the uh, joint session on day one of the special session, he acknowledged that. You know, it's uh, everyone knows about it, of course. And he said... He kind of turned this negative, he tried to spin it into a positive for him, saying, look at me, I can compromise. I took out my managed care plan. I didn't try to ram it down your throat, so I hope you will also be pragmatic as I have been as we go into the coming days. Yeah. These are powerful interests that, that are involved in this. That's right. Yeah, you've got you know you know big big healthcare companies on one side of it, um, and then uh, you know then you've got uh, doctors and providers on the other side of it, and that's what we've kind of seen battling it out. Um, you know, and these are tens, hundreds of millions of dollars that are involved. That's right. That's right. I mean, in in the governor, these two plans are, are aiming to, to save north of a billion dollars over a five-year period. Uh, the governor's plan uh, apparently saves $1.4 billion. Diamond Care saves a little more than a billion dollars. Uh, and they're very complex plans as well. And that sort of, I think, was borne out, I think, in the middle of the week. The governor came out on Tuesday, the day before the special session was to begin, and pulled managed care down. Uh, then the Diamond Care proponents uh, presented their plan in uh, the Health Care Task Force And Committee. they're a bipartisan group in, in Diamond Care. That's right, a bipartisan group, uh, Missy Irvin, and then some Demis uh, Michelle Gray, and some Democratic legislators as well, Keith Ingram, I believe. Interesting, Missy Irvin is one of the holdouts on, or not holdouts, but one of the no votes on the private option, at least this time, even though she's voted for it in the past, and here's a plan she's backing, not making on the agenda. Right, exactly. Uh, so anyway, I, you know, very complex plans uh, that um, that I think what everyone arrived at and, and sort of what it made it easier for everyone to walk away from managed care was these are these are very difficult things. There's a lot of moving parts, and members need their time need more time to wrap their minds around what this legislation would do. Well, walk away for how long, though? 
There's, there does seem to be a consensus that we're moving in the direction of managed care, almost have to. Well, we already have another special session planned for highways. We may have another one for managed care. Uh, but also this decision to withdraw it complicated the politics of passing Arkansas Works a little bit because in the months beforehand, the governor had argued that you cannot continue Medicaid expansion unless you get these cuts from traditional Medicaid. We can't pay for what the state's portion uh, of, of Medicaid expansion, but here he is you know, withdrawing it the day before, saying, well, maybe these are separate a little bit. The House Speaker has said that he thinks many of the members view them as separate as well. But we've had this argument for months now that they are connected. Mm -hmm. Continue, please, the, the political complications here on this thing, the dynamic at work. Right. Well, it, you know, it seems like, surprisingly, based on the way we've been talking about Medicaid expansion for so long now, that it is less controversial than managed care. So, you know, if the argument is that Medicaid expansion saves the state government money, around $150 million a year is what Representative Charlie Collins and others on the health care task force will say, then why do you need to make these traditional Medicaid cuts in the first place? So a member's going to have to decide what the real math behind that is, but uh, the governor at least has sort of dropped that argument for this special session in terms of connecting them. We are making a little headway, it would appear, on the economy, in the Arkansas economy. Mm -hmm. yeah, Things so continue to look a little brighter, right, progressive yeah. with each month. That's right, yeah. Uh, in terms of the uh, the state revenue picture, we got some, some good news this week. Uh, the numbers for March were out and showed us that so far in the fiscal year, we're about uh, $73 million above forecast in terms of the collections that we've brought in. Uh, and then for the month, we were at $414 million roughly, uh, about $50 million ahead of the same time last year, and then about $40 million above forecast. Sales and individual income tax collections continue to, to move along very well. Um, and so uh, this was a point that the governor brought out uh, on the floor of the, of the House uh, chamber during the joint session on, uh, on Thursday or Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. It's the days are running together. Uh, but, but that, you know, the economy is doing well. Unemployment is at, you know, a low we haven't seen since the early 2000s or 2000. Um, and so um, things appear to be, to be looking up, even on a national uh, um, uh, basis. Uh, the labor force participation rate has has improved over the last several months. That's kind of been a knock on this recovery is that, yeah, the unemployment rate's low, but you don't have as many people who are actively looking for jobs. If, if you know, even if you are unemployed, if you're looking, you're counted in that uh, in that survey. Uh, but we've seen numbers here in the last few days that indicate that, uh, you know, more people are feeling more confident to go back looking go for back. a job. So uh, that's a good sign. Yeah. Even though even though claims may go up a little bit, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right, right, exactly, and it, and it's a it's a moving target. It changes every week, and and, and we're still claims are at um, you know lows that we haven't seen in several years as well. So, um, also uh, here in Arkansas, uh, a little good news in in a part of the world that could use it, uh, in uh, near Pine Bluff in Jefferson County, uh, word that we've got a three point seven billion dollar. Uh, 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 the energy plant that is apparently on the way to uh, to hopefully employ more than 200 people uh, once it gets up and running. The land deal on that, um, some agreements were signed on that this week, uh, tied to uh, to a lease of property, 1,100 acres on the banks of the Arkansas River uh, for this plant to go in. This is a company called Energy Security Partners, uh, and on the board of that company are uh, some influential and familiar Arkansans, Wesley Clark, uh, the retired Army General, uh, and the former U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Rodney Slater, uh, guiding this company. And uh, Pine Bluff had known it was in the running for this plant, and, and even at the outset, indications were fairly strong that it was going to um, it was going to be the place for this, uh, but they actually signed the lease papers this week, and so uh, that's a good sign for a part of the world that that desperately needs more jobs. Why Pine Bluff? Uh, it's it's situated fairly well for this company. There's a lot of stuff they can only bring in by river, and so there's a good site on the river there, and then there's some uh, natural gas pipelines in that part of the world where things work well, and then also uh, they've done a pretty good job of incentives in that part of the world. Um, they've uh, they've dedicated uh, some some um, some income tax dollars or, or some local sales tax dollars for that, and the local uh, economic uh, development team down there has really uh, worked to uh, provide you know all the necessary help that this company needs to be there. And so uh, you've got a very influential uh, Arkansas businessman, George Macris, who's the head of Simmons First National Bank, uh, large publicly traded banking company based in Pine Bluff uh, who's who's on that development team as well and so uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the ducks have gotten in a row for that park project to take place and so Let's take that take the Arkansas economy and route it back to the matter of state budgeting <clears throat> obviously uh, collections up 
gives the administration and the General Assembly a bit of breathing room in terms of appropriations. And yet, the, we have had several, uh, particularly in higher ed, but we've had several department heads warn publicly, we need a budget and, and we don't need any, we can't take any more cuts without Newton's law cutting in here, factoring in. Yeah, uh, uh, for the state budget picture, I believe education got a 1% raise, higher education is flat, uh, UAMS, the uh, Dan Dr. Don Ron, who heads that organization, has is, is talked about uh, the dire straits that they're in. I mean, it's a situation, though, that's been repeating for the past few budgets. Uh, so people have learned to live with it in some way, but on the other hand, we have, you know, some constitutional officers and elected officials getting pay raises. There is no cost of living adjustment for state employees, on the other hand. But, uh, you know, it, it, they're planning a budget based on some all-time best figures, which gives some people concern, are these numbers going to hold up forever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you know, we're looking to you to keep them up there, Alex. Well, yeah, well, there's nothing I can do about it, but uh, I guess I can keep spending uh, or buying things that I can't necessarily afford. Talk but, um, up, talk yeah, up, yeah, talk but, it up, yeah. But I mean, but you know, uh, the thing with UAMS is that they are very much, you know, the private option is kind of lifeblood to them and, and, and other healthcare providers as well. Um, those uncompensated care costs going down have, have been great for their budget. Uh, even still, even without what could or could not happen next week at the at the legislature, they're still looking at um, at, at shortfalls coming up in in their, in their coming year. So, uh, for there to be another uh, budget round of budget cuts to them would be fairly devastating, and they would look at all parts of that organization. Uh, to, to cut back and make up ground. And so you'll hear Dan Ron, uh, we've got a story coming out on Monday where he's talking about this. You'll probably hear him next week uh, and, and other, you know, uh, other leaders at, uh, at public entities around the state, um, you know, advocating to keep uh, the private option. But at this point, it seems like it's people advocating for their increased budgets are mostly people from those institutions, some advocacy groups like Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families and uh, Citizens First Congress. But you don't find a lot of specific legislators, at least in positions of tr uh, greater power, at least, calling for specific increases in these programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. On to uh, politics. We have uh, our former First Lady. Uh, who's in a race that suddenly is a l rather more contentious than it started out. I mean, it's taken, the campaign's really taken an edge. Right, so the last primary I think that we had was, was in Wisconsin. Bernie Sanders, I think, maybe came in with 56% of the vote or something like that. Uh, we're heading into New York, which Good is win. another former home of uh, First Lady Hillary Clinton. Uh, <laughs> another, she's, former home. another former <laughs> home. Yeah. She was a U.S. Senator there, started her uh, elected career there. Uh, Bernie Sanders says we can win New York. We'll see. Uh, Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, is a backer of Hillary Clinton, though they've had a very tumultuous endorsement process throughout. He, he waited a long time to endorse her, seemed to have ticked her off <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you see all the traditional New York City kind of politics stories, like uh, Bernie Sanders said they use tokens for the subway when they use a card, and Hillary Clinton didn't know how to swipe the card. But they're all trying to prove that they're average Joes and New Yorkers. Just like uh, you and me. Right. John Kasich is eating pizza, <laughs> I think, yeah. with a fork, you know, with a fork and stuff like right. that. Who played second for the Yankees in 54, <laughs> you know, and hit 320, you remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. Bernie Sanders might know that. Uh, yeah, he's, actually, he's from Brooklyn, yeah, actually, he's, so he's, he's, he's another home state guy yeah. in a way. Yeah, it did. Well, it he's did still take... pining for the Dodgers, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it did take an edge, though, because there were these... Well, in as much as the Democratic primary has had an edge to it, I mean, if you, you can't really compare it to what's been going on in the GOP primary, uh, which which has really gotten in the gutter a lot. Uh, but but it, but this was, you know, you had uh, Bernie Sanders saying that, that Hillary Clinton is not qualified to be president for all the reasons that he claims that she's not qualified for that. And so it's kind of it's kind of taken on an edge. And I think um, I think there are certain corners of the political world that really paints Hillary Clinton as being frustrated and she's had enough of Bernie Sanders still hanging around this long. Uh, she just cannot seem to vanquish him. And even though she commands a sizable delegate lead, uh, the Sanders campaign is still hoping in New York to make a legitimate argument that, you know, maybe some of these superdelegates that are pledged to Hillary Clinton, maybe it's time they take a second look at us and, um, and maybe we'll have a, our own contested convention when it comes time for us to finally choose our, our nominee. It's hard yeah. to know if momentum is really a real thing or not. But Bernie Sanders has won seven out of the eight last uh, primaries and caucuses. Most of those are in western states with demographics that most pundits say are conventionally better for him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, this whole time along we've been saying, oh, 
maybe someone could get Donald Trump off a contested convention. Everyone is looking for anything to have an excuse to say the Republican race is still going. Mm -hmm. But on the Democratic side, people have wanted this to be over for a long time, mm -hmm. except for <laughs> the candidates and the voters who backed Bernie Sanders. Right. Yeah, well, I know two Democrats who wanted it over anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but let's bring it back to Arkansas. Well, uh, Mrs. Clinton already up, you know, has the Arkansas primaries history. She's got the delegates from here. Mm -hmm. But the Arkansas GOP delegates are kind of in limbo. Right, and it's um, or, yeah. all, the, all of the big fish, at least, were for Marco Rubio, who's, of course, he's not running for president anymore. His campaign is suspended. He didn't end it, so they, we'll see which, if Rubio indicates to his supporters at least who they want him to back in one of those conventions. It seemed like Ted Cruz, he came in a second, I believe, in Ar Arkansas's primary behind Donald Trump. A lot of elected officials had backed him at least before. It seemed more, the elected officials at least seemed more like Cruz backers than Donald Trump backers. Mm -hmm. I should think. Right, but the state of Arkansas, I mean, they've clearly said, at least through the primary, they want Donald Trump. Yeah. So we'll have to see if Republican Party elites want to reflect the will of the voters or not. Well, they're being courted. Lens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and this, you know, of course, this is a process that I don't even pretend to have any kind of um, <laughs> insider knowledge of because it seems so arcane. And it also seems that, you know, as in the run-up to the convention, the rules could even change. I mean, you hear a lot about uh, the party leaders getting together and trying to decide what they'll do and what rules will remain in effect. And, I mean, they can change all this stuff at the last minute. Sure. So, um, yeah, I think Doyle Webb is in an interesting uh, spot uh, in the run-up to this, uh, the, the leader of the state Republican Party. And... Um, you know, it it will be interesting as the weeks get closer to to kind of see you know what these delegates are going to do. You know, Marco Rubio has been firm that that my delegates stay with me at least so far, uh, and and maybe uh, we'll get some more clarity as things get get closer to the convention. Uh, but of course, at the same time, while all of the state's Republicans that backed someone other than Trump, at least they all said after on primary night after Trump won Arkansas's uh, primary that they would back the eventual nominee if it's Donald Trump. Of course, who the nominee is, I guess that's the big question. We mm -hmm. don't know if we'll know going into the convention. Some, some of them did. I think there's some others, though. Uh, you know, some, some legislative members have sort of talked like, we're not necessarily wanting to fall in line behind someone just because they're the nominee. A few of them have said that. Uh, With how much, if any, gusto. Well, right. It, yeah, and, and, right. and again, things can change. This was several weeks ago, so, you know, we'll never know. But. And we had Nate Bell, the uh, only independent in the legislature, saying at, on primary night that he wants a third-party candidate. He might back the libertarian, likely nominee Gary Johnson, who's formerly a, a governor of New Mexico. Not yeah. Well, if Mr. Webb, the, the, the GOP's executive director, he's the senior executive officer of the Republican Party. The titular head of the party is Mr. Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, you have an all-GOP congressional delegation. <laughs> They're the ones that are kind of, uh, trying, where are we going to fit into this thing? I mean, it, it matters to them. Mr. Hutchinson's midterm. Right, especially mm -hmm. to John Bozeman, he'll be running against Connor mm -hmm. Eldridge. And uh, a lot of people have asked if Donald Trump is the nominee, is it going to drag down every other down ballot Republican candidate? We don't know that. Um, uh, Donald Trump has seemed to, if anything, increase turnout for Republican primaries and caucuses, not necessarily for those candidates down ballot. Uh, we, some signs, at least, John Bozeman is. Uh, he met with Merrick Garland, the Supreme Court nominee for President Obama this week. He says under no conditions will he advocate for the nomination or the confirmation process going forward. But, you know, that's some signs at least of it, Republican candidates like John Bozeman willing to go to the middle, even though we are in this very heated atmosphere. Well, we will continue to watch the Senate race very, very closely, but obviously the GOP at the national level and I think at the local levels too still consider Senator, considers Senator Bozeman's seat safe. Mm. Uh, uh, it's in swing districts where the pressure is mounting. Right. And another, another big issue brought up by this. Well, and you, you also had the gentleman from Kansas <laughs> reverse himself this past week and say, wait a minute, yeah, I was for a hearing, but now I'm not. That's, that's, that, uh, Chuck Grassley, is that you're referring to? The not, Senate? not Grassley, but, uh, forgive me. Well, in any event. <laughs> he had said, no, I'd rather get fired for doing my job. Uh, and yeah. voting no, then not holding hearings at all. Yeah. Well, there was a right-wing revolt in, in his base, and he said, well, on second thought, you win. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you have a lot of people, that's another Trump aspect is, well, maybe Mer Merrick Garland isn't so bad. He's not the most liberal guy. Uh, Bernie Sanders wouldn't appoint him. Hillary Clinton probably wouldn't appoint him if, if they are elected. We don't know who Donald Trump would appoint. But, you know, this is Trump question. It, it really does go down the ballot, though. Uh, he, he, of course, is against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He thinks there's a lot of problems with free trade deals. 
uh, we have Connor Eldridge coming out saying he is against mm -hmm. the TPP. Mm -hmm. John Bozeman still has not made a position. So maybe they're not going to be running directly saying I'm a Trump candidate lower down the ballot, but they, they are bringing up issues that they're going to have to answer. Yeah, Lance? Yeah, the, and, and that, that is true. That, uh, he has sort of struck a tone, Donald Trump has, that, that everyone else sort of has to answer to, and that's sort of been true for the, to the entirety of this race, really. He's sort of called the shots, but trade has been something that has resonated, uh, and it's made other people, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton even, I mean, people that, that you would not have thought would come out against uh, a, a trade deal, you know, really emphatically make their position finally known, which is probably a good thing. Yeah, and we've got a Cuba trade seminar coming up in Arkansas. That's right, yeah, Cuba is is sort of a, the hot topic and, and a lot of folks are interested in it because Arkansas, I think, stands to gain uh, a fair amount. Uh, and so we've got uh, we've got some action starting next week uh, around uh, around Cuba and we've already had some symposiums and seminars discussing Cuba. We've had people going to Cuba and doing work, the governor, of course. Um, Arkansas uh, stands with its agricultural base uh, to really make some gains, uh, you know, doing business with Cuba, if we can get uh, key elements of that embargo, if not the entire embargo, uh, re uh, lifted. Yeah, we're a ways from it. Yes, we. I think we are. Yeah. Guys, thanks to you for coming in. Yep. As always, thanks to you for watching. See you next week. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.